Uh, Alfonso says we've uh, known each other already for several years, and it is always a, a great pleasure and, and lots of fun to work uh, with, uh, with Alfonso. Uh, I, am, I am going to be talking today about um, the following problem. So um, we are going to consider the problem minus Laplace and u equal absolute value of u uh, and then uh, there is an exponent there, 2 to the star minus 2 times u in omega. Uh, so um, omega is going to be an open and bounded set in Rn. N is going to be greater than or equal to 3. And the boundary of omega, we are going to assume it is smooth. So um, this delta, as always, is just the Laplace operator. OK, so this is a PDE. And uh, this number, 2 to the star, is a number which depends only on n. And it is uh, called the critical Sobolev exponent. So um, in, the, in the course of, the, of this talk, I, I will uh, tell you what, um, what the main features about this exponent are. OK? So this talk, this whole talk, will be only about this problem. So the first thing I have to tell you is, well, we are going to be looking for solutions. So uh, we are going to be looking for functions defined on omega with the real values that satisfy the equation and that are 0 on the boundary of, of the domain. Okay, And the kind of questions we are interested in are, uh, well, does this problem have a solution? So that's the first question. And then, well, if it has one solution, does it have many solutions? Maybe there are other solutions, maybe not. OK? And we are also interested in saying something about the solution. So what's the shape of the solution? Whether the solution changed sign or not? Whether it has some symmetries or it, it doesn't? And so on. OK? So. Why is one actually interested in uh, studying this problem? Well, let me give you some reasons for studying this problem. This problem actually arises in uh, differential geometry in questions where um, uh, conformal invariance plays a role. So there are very famous problems in differential geometry, like the Yamabe problem or the prescribed curvature problem, where an elliptic equation with critical exponent plays a role. And the reason why the critical exponent plays a role is because you are interested in problems where uh, the conformal invariance plays a role. So I will say something about uh, conformal invariance also uh, further on. Okay. The other reason why uh, one is interested in, in studying this problem is because although it is a variational problem, it is not a, a, a straightforward one. I mean, it has uh, difficulties. It is really a challenging problem because essentially one, one uh, can do, does not have compactness. And not having compactness means that the usual variational methods cannot just be applied in a straightforward manner. Well, the third reason is that, uh, I mean, although it looks uh, very, very simple, this problem has a very rich conformal structure. And I will, I will go into that also in this talk. And, and you will see uh, uh, a little bit about the structure of this problem and, and uh, what uh, uh, is the effect of this geometry. And uh, well, all of this has uh, uh, made this problem a, a really a, a, a source of new problems, new ideas. And uh, well, I mean, I can say it's a beautiful problem. And I hope I will be able to convince you of that. OK? Well, let me go to the variational problem. That the problem is variational, well, now let me consider not only the critical exponent, but I will consider an exponent p, which is larger than 2, 
and smaller than or equal this critical exponent, okay? So the solutions of these problems of this problem are uh, critical points of a functional which looks like that is one half of the integral of gradient u square minus one over p the integral of u to the p for u in this space. So uh, for those of you who know uh, something about Sobolev spaces, this h01 is just the, the closure of um, the space of smooth uh, functions with compact support in omega in the Sobolev space of L2 functions, which have um, uh, derivatives, partial derivatives in L2. Okay, for those of you who do uh, are not familiar with uh, with Sobolev spaces, it doesn't matter. The only thing that is important is th this guy is an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. Okay, so um, let us look closer at the functional JP, okay? So if we look at the functional JP, we will see that uh, it has a quadratic term, the first sum and this is a quadratic term with a positive coefficient. And the second part, the second uh, sum and is uh, uh, something to the power P with a negative coefficient, okay? So since p is, um, we are assuming it's larger than 2, then this means if you are uh, near the origin, the quadratic term will win, and it has a positive uh, coefficient, so it will go up, okay? And far away from the origin, the term to the power p will win, and it has a negative uh, coefficient. So the, the, the function will go to, to minus infinity. Okay, so the graph in each direction, although it is defined in a, in a Hilbert space, an infinite dimensional Hilbert space, if we look at any one dimensional subspace of this Hilbert space, the graph of the function just looks like this. No? And if we look at everything together, well, it looks like, a, I mean, like a valley, okay, which is surrounded by mountains. Okay, so if we are looking for solutions of our problem, what we have to do is to look for critical points, okay? And if you are looking for critical points, well, the, the simplest thing to, to think of is, well, let's try to, I am standing in the center of the valley, I want to get out, let's try to find a mountain pass, okay? So you just take all possible paths and you try to find a path which goes the l to the uh, least highest altitude, okay? Or another way to look at it is uh, like uh, Peter was saying, just look at uh, what w mathematicians call the negative gradient flow. So you just have your valley which is surrounded by mountains. You let it rain over the valley. You take each drop of rain and you follow it through. And where it stops, there you have a critical point, okay? So this is, of course, true in the space we live in, in a finite dimensional space. But th the problem with an infinite dimensional space is that this little drop of rain maybe will not arrive to a critical point. So what can happen is something like this, you see? If, you, if your domain is a space which is not compact, then you can have um, different uh, types of behavior. So, uh, for example, if you look at this green point right here, if you follow the drop of rain, it will get to a minimum. So that's okay. No? This, the green points are okay because the, f the negative gradient flow will take them to a critical point, to a minimum, to a local minimum. Also, the red points are okay because, I mean, if you are up here, the rain won't move. I mean, the drop will just stay there, okay? But say if you are at this blue point, oops, does it, is it, ah, no, I'm, it's this one. If you are at this blue point right here, okay, then you, you follow your drop of rain, you see, and the point, the blue point, will go to minus infinity. You will never arrive to a critical point. 
And this is due to the lack of compactness of your space. So although our function is like a valley surrounded by mountains, and say that the highest point in each direction lies in a sphere, an infinite dimensional sphere is not compact. So this is what makes the difference between infinite dimensional spaces and finite dimensional spaces, okay? So one really has to be careful in applying this negative gradient flow methods when one is in an infinite dimensional space, okay? So the question we have to ask is, well, say we, are, we have a situation like this where uh, you have uh, a flow line, okay? where the functional is bounded below. And the question is, does this flow line approach a critical point or, or doesn't it? So for example, this one, here the flow line, the functional is bounded below by this, this uh, dotted line, and it goes to minus infinity. It doesn't get to a critical point. So in our case, the case that uh, is uh, related to the, to the um, to the um, elliptic equation, the functional JP has a nice behavior, a good behavior, if P has happens to be smaller than the critical exponent. So if P is smaller than the critical exponent, then you really can uh, follow it every flow line and it will approach a critical point. So you can use the, the well-known critical point methods. But if P is the critical exponent, then you have a behavior like this. There, there will be uh, flow lines where which go to infinity, say. So then this means you cannot, uh, you cannot use the, the usual variational methods to obtain solutions of the problem. OK. <coughs> And in fact, what uh, one does is one, one uses different methods. But uh, it is not only a question of which method you use to solve the problem, you see? Because in fact, the behavior of the problem for, the, for P below the critical exponent is completely different to the, to the behavior of the problem for the critical exponent. So for example, I mean, if you look at this problem, with P sub critical, then it is well known that it has infinitely many solutions. Always, for every P smaller than 2 to the star. Okay? Whereas if you look at the problem for P equal 2 to the star, then in some domains as easy as a ball, you have no solutions. Of course, you have always the trivial solution. So U, U equals 0 is a solution, but that's not an interesting solution. But uh, in a ball, the problem has no solution, no non-trivial solutions if P is the critical exponent. So you see the problem is, is uh, it's lots of fun because it's not easy, okay? Okay. So let me give you, start giving you, well, the, 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 the title of the talk was a classical and new result. So let me give you the classical results about this problem, okay? So the first result about this problem was a non-existence result. And this non-existence result was due to Pohoshaev in uh, 65, and he showed that the problem the crit uh, now I'm concentrating only on the critical exponent problem. So the critical exponent problem has no solution if the domain is strictly star-shaped. So if the domain is a ball or it is a convex domain, then Pohoshaev has shown this problem has no solution other than the trivial solution. Okay. So in fact, whether this problem has a solution or not depends on the domain, which is a different behavior than the subcritical case. Another interesting feature about this problem is that the mountain path never exists. I mean, so if you try to find a path going from the center of the valley outside, okay, and you try to find the least uh, uh, altitude, 
for which you have a, a, a can go from one side to the other, this doesn't exist. There is no mountain pass, okay? There is no mountain pass. Okay. On the other hand, there are domains where there are many solutions. So the first existence result is a result by Kasdan and Warner in 75. And they show that if you consider an annulus, that is, you consider a ball, okay, of radius b, and take out a concentric ball of radius smaller than b, of radius a, then in this sky, you have infinitely many solutions. But in fact, although this result is, is very nice, it is kind of uh, natural, you see, because if you are in a domain like this, you can look for radial solutions, so for solutions which are constant on each sphere, okay? And then if you are looking for solutions which are constant on each sphere, this means you are really looking at uh, for solutions in some interval, okay, of some second order uh, differential equation. But this is an, I mean, if you are on an interval, then it is not a PDE anymore, it's an ODE. Okay, so this fact was used by Kasdan and Warner to show that in this case, for this domain, you have infinitely many radial solutions. Okay, so what about, <coughs> so the symmetries, the very uh, strong symmetries in this problem play a role in finding this infinitely many radial solutions. Uh, so what about other domains? Okay, well, the first uh, non-trivial result about this problem was is due to Coron, who showed in 84 that um, the following. So say you start with any domain. You start with a domain that may be, for example, a convex domain, where Pogoshayev has told us there is no solution. And then you take this domain and you make a tiny hole, okay? Well, if this hole is small enough, okay, if the hole is tiny enough, then what Coron showed is that th there is always a positive solution. So take any domain, make a hole. If the hole is small enough, then the problem has a positive solution. So this is kind of crazy, you see, because this says, well, if you just take any domain, say, for example, a ball where you know there's no solution, and you perturb it a little bit, you get a positive solution, okay? Okay. And now, so we have already three classical results. Paul Scheib, which who says no solution in, in, in strictly star-shaped domains. Kasdan Warner, who say, infinitely many solutions in an annulus. Coron, who says one positive solution in every domain which has a, a small enough hole, okay? Now, the most uh, remark remarkable result so far is a result due to uh, Barry and Coron. So Barry and Coron proved that uh, it doesn't matter whether the hole is small or large. If you have a domain with a hole, or more precisely, if uh, the, the reduced singular homology with CMO2 coefficients of omega is non-trivial, then you have always a positive solution. So this is a really a very, a quite remarkable and a very strong result. And um, the proof No, 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 it means it has some topology. It means you can think, if you have a domain which is not contractible, say, th think of it like that. Uh, that's a, a good uh, way to think about it. You have a domain which is not contractible, then you have a solution, okay? Now, what lies behind the result, or the proof of the result, rather, I mean, it uses a fancy algebraic topology, but it uses also the fact that one knows all positive solutions 
for the problem on the whole Euclidean space, Rn. So I will come to that uh, in a while. But first, uh, let, me, let me go back to your question. No? So uh, Barry Coron say, if your domain is not contractible, it, if it has some topology, okay, then one has a positive solution. On the other hand, Pohoshayev says, if you have a domain which is uh, strictly star-shaped, then there is no solution. Now, every strictly star-shaped domain is contractible. No, you can contract it to the point where the star shape begins, say. Okay? So one can ask, well, maybe one has a stronger result than that of Pokoshayev. Poko maybe one can prove that this is an if and only if. No? And the answer is no, this is not true. So there are examples. So the question is, is it true that there are no solutions if the domain is contractible? The answer is no. And the kind of examples, I mean, there are uh, several people have he given examples, but a typical example goes, goes like this. If you take an annulus and you carve a very thin tunnel joining the interior and the exterior of the annulus, then this is, of course, contractible because you can take this part like this and contract it to a point, okay? But Nevertheless, although this is contractible, it, in this domain there is a positive solution. Okay? So you see the problem is really difficult, understanding which, in which domains one has a solution and in which domains wha one doesn't have a solution is, is a really a very difficult problem. Okay? Okay. Now let me say something about the problem not in a bounded domain, but in the whole Euclidean space, okay? Let us look at the problem on the whole Euclidean space. So I just told you that uh, Barry and Coron uh, proved that um, uh, uh, there exists a solution in a domain which, which has no non-trivial topology, and that they use the fact that one knows all positive solutions of this problem. So what are the positive solutions? Well, the positive solutions are precisely these guys, okay? Which are called the, the standard bubbles or the instantons, depending on whether you come from geometry or from physics. So since this problem comes really from geometry, I, I call them standard bubbles. So uh, the standard bubbles just look like this, are this function. So for every positive number delta and every psi, every point psi in Rn, you look at this function where this is a coefficient which depends only on n, and you look at this, at this function. Well, all of these functions are the positive solutions. And in fact, they, they have minimal energy among all possible solutions. So you see this is something which is uh, not compact because this is Rn multiplied by zero infinity. No? So this, this whole set of solutions are kind of the, the, the ground state solutions. These are the mountain passes, okay? In the case, the domain is Rn. And for a while, people thought, well, these are the only solutions for the problem in Rn. But this is not true. There are also sign-changing solutions. And um, in fact, uh, Ding Waiyue, showed uh, in 86 that there are infinitely many sign-changing solutions. But unlike uh, positive solutions, here one doesn't really know all, all sign-changing solutions, whether those of things are all of them or not or whatever. So, so uh, the only thing one can really deal with are the positive solutions. Okay, so, so here are some standard bubbles. And in fact, you see, in some sense, one can say that there is only, essentially, only one positive solution. Because if you take, say, the solution where delta is equal 1 and which is centered at the origin, every other instanton is going to be uh, a, a, a translation and a dilation of one of them. 
So up to translation and dilation and this coefficient right here, all the standard bubbles are the same. Okay, so there's only one up to trans translation and dilation. Okay. So now let me tell you something. Let me tell you something about uh, new results concerning this problem. So we only have so far either non-existence or existence results. No? But say in the cases like the Coron case, where we know there is a positive solution in a domain with a tiny hole, okay? Are there more solutions? Can we find more solutions? Okay. So a colleague of mine, Tobias Veth, who is uh, currently at Mainz University in Germany, and I, I mean, we, we looked at, the, at the, the same problem Coran did. So let's take any domain and let's make a tiny hole, okay? So Coron has told us there is one solution. So what uh, Tobias and I managed to prove was that there are two solutions. So if the hole is small enough, you can find two solutions, okay? Now, what does one know about these two solutions? Well, okay, uh, I want to go back. How do we go back? I don't know. Well, it doesn't matter. Okay. So first of all, the proof of this result is variational. We use variational methods. But as I told you before, one cannot uh, just use straightforward variational methods. One has really to be very careful with the negative gradient flow. Have one needs really to have very good control on the negative gradient flow. That's one point. And the other thing is one has to use some deep algebraic topology. So similar kind of, uh, of uh, gadgets as uh, 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 Barry and Coron used. The other thing is, well, one of the solutions we know very well. One of the solutions is just Coron solution, which is uh, one knows a lot about Coron solution. Coron solution looks like a standard bubble which is very concentrated and which is centered on this hole. So you take this guy here, you put it on top of the hole, and that's how Coron solution more or less looks like, okay? As, as the hole goes to zero, okay? So when the hole goes to zero, goes to a point, uh, the solution obtained by Coron looks like this, okay? Um, so what about the other solution that Tobias and I found? No clue. We don't know whether the solution is positive, whether it changes sign, how does it look like? We know nothing. So uh, in fact, we were, I mean, we wanted to find a sign changing solution. That was our idea, but uh, uh, well, well, we couldn't, wouldn't, we couldn't prove anything about the second solution. Okay, so, um, but there are two. Now, uh, recently together with Monica Musso from uh, Santiago de Chile and um, Angela Pistoia from Rome, uh, we proved the following. We proved that uh, if you start with a domain like this one, okay, where the boundary consists as at least of two pieces. So the boundary is not connected. And then you take a point, xi naught, which is close enough to the boundary of the domain. And there you make a tiny hole, okay? So we looked at domains like this. So the additional requirement is that the boundary is not connected. So you look at the domain, you start with a domain where the boundary is not connected, and you make a hole, a tiny hole, which is close enough to the boundary of the domain, okay? And then we were able to show that uh, this problem has two positive solutions, okay? So in fact, one can say in this case, how do the, the solutions look like? So one of the solutions is just Coron solution, which looks like a standard bubble, okay? 
And the other solution is quite nice because it looks as the sum of two standard bubbles centered at different points, okay? So the center of one of the bubbles is just inside the shrinking hole. So the center of one of the bubbles is here inside the hole. And the other, the center of the other bubble is inside the domain. So the centers remain fixed as epsilon goes to zero, okay? So you have a point here, uh, psi naught, and some other point somewhere, we don't know where, which is this other point, psi one. And the solution looks like a bubble which concentrates on psi naught plus another bubble which concentrates on psi one. Uh -huh. If I have n tiny holes, then I have n solutions. But here I only have one tiny hole and one large hole, you see? So the large hole doesn't help. If the holes are very small, yes. yes. No, so are no, I don't know. I have no idea. No, there, i there is no solution that spikes up in the big hole. That, that one doesn't know. Because you see, the solutions are constructed by using the instantons. So what you need is, if you just have the instanton and have no hole, the instanton will blow up. But if you put in a tiny hole, a very small hole, that prevents it from blowing up. But in the large hole, I have no idea what I have. So if I wouldn't have if I wouldn't have this tiny hole, okay? Well Bari Coron tells us there is one solution, but we don't know how it looks like. Huh? If you have uh, this is what I'm saying. If you have a big hole and a small hole like this. Well, if you have, say you have any domain with 100 holes, then, then on each hole, you can put a solution. Huh? You can put a solution. But the hole has to be very small, OK? But uh, this is the only thing one knows. And one solution means one, one bubble solution, huh? OK? So this is really very delicate. I mean, I don't know if there are more in this domain. I don't know if there are more than two solutions. This is the only thing we know, OK? OK. But so far, we only have positive solutions, OK? What about sign-changing solutions? OK. Well, the reason why Tobias, yes. Mm -hmm. It can be wherever, you can put it here, but it has to be close to the boundary, okay? So the, the, the um, let me go back. How does one go back? Like this? No. It, 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 can, it has to be, the, 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 the condition is that this point where you are making the tiny hole has to be close to the boundary. So it has to be close to this boundary or to the other boundary, whatever. Like here, it doesn't matter. It just has to be close to the boundary. Ah, uh, you say like here? No, it won't work. It won't work. You have a number, uh, say r not, and we, we can say if the point, the distance of the point to the boundary is smaller than r not, then you have a, and you make a hole, a tiny hole there, then you have a, a second solution. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Well, it's, it's kind of a perturbation result. What you really say is, as epsilon goes to zero, you are able to find a solution at, at, at some point, okay? But you cannot really say the size of the hole has to be, I don't know, so many nanometers. Or <laughs> I, <don't know. laughs> I, I mean, it's, it's kind of a perturbative result. You, s you know that as epsilon goes to zero for epsilon close enough to zero, you can you can you can find the solution. I will go to back. To I will tell you also some things about large holes. We have also re some results about large holes. So just be a little bit patient. So first of all, I want to tell you something about the uh, sign changing solutions. So also with Tobias Vet, we look at the um, again at the at the, uh, uh, coron type uh, domain. Okay, but now we want it to be symmetric with respect to the origin. So we ask for some symmetries, and then we are able to prove the existence of a sign-changing solution. So you, you, you start with a domain which is symmetric with respect to the origin. That is, if you have a point here, then the opposite point is also in the domain, okay? So if x is in the domain, minus x is also in the domain, okay? And then you make a, a tiny hole at the origin, okay? So if the hole is small enough, Tobias and I show that there is a solution, and the solution looks like the sum of two uh, standard bubbles, a positive one, you see, here, and a negative one, okay? So, I mean, this was nice. This, the proof is variational, so it's really very simple. Variational proofs are, are very simple, but then, you know, this, this colleagues, uh, Monica Musso and Angela Pistoia, looked at this result and said, well, if there is one sign-changing solution, there should be many sign-changing solutions. So they proved this very, very beautiful result. I like it a lot. You know where they, they prove, well, again, you start with an omega, which is symmetric with respect to the origin. You take out a tiny ball, and what the result says the number of sign-changing solutions goes to infinity as the radius of the ball you are taking out goes to zero. And in fact, the solutions look like, like superpositions or like sums of standard bubbles with alternating signs and, of course, different dilation coefficients. Okay? So you have here a positive one plus a negative one plus again a positive one, and so on, okay? So the proof is um, they use what's called finite dimensional reduction, which means two things. One thing is you have to make a good guess, okay? You, you have to say, well, I think there should be a solution that looks like this, okay? And then you make an ansatz. And then you have to make very delicate computations in order to, to, uh, to prove that uh, what you suspect is really a solution, okay? So these are, um, okay, so these are results on, on sign-changing solutions. And uh, then together with these two, two girls, we uh, looked at, um, at the question, well, the, the solutions I showed you pre previously, they all concentrate, all the bubbles concentrate at the origin. So the question was, are there also multi-bubble solutions, those which do not look like, like towers of solutions concentrating at the same point? And the answer is, uh, is yes. And in fact, we found a solution like this, which consists of three standard bubbles, but one of them is concentrated at the origin, Okay, so where the hole is, is, is being made, okay, so say you, you have a positive one centered at the origin inside the shrinking hole, and then you have uh, two negative bubbles concentrated at antipodal points. So there is some point x, uh, xi naught, and uh, the, the two negative bubbles are centered one at plus xi naught and the other one at minus xi naught, so inside the domain omega. Which is actually quite, um, quite astonishing because all there are some previous results about, uh, as I told you, that if you have many tiny holes, you can find uh, bubbles on each tiny hole. 
But you see, these other two bubbles do not concentrate on the whole. They concentrate inside the domain. So it is enough that one of them concentrates at the whole. So this, is, this was kind of uh, surprising in a sense. And again, the proof is by a finite dimensional reduction. Okay? So this is kind of, uh, these are the type of results one knows about for tiny holes. Okay? Now let me say something about large holes. Okay? What does one know about large holes? This is a lot more difficult question, you see, because here, what one does in this type of results is one plays with the standard bubbles. Okay? So one takes this model, which is the standard bubble, with one plays it here, and then these other bubbles are placed somewhere else, and do you do some computations and you obtain results. But the, the fact that the, the hole is tiny really plays an enormous role here. And what's surprising about the result by Barry and Coron is that it works for any hole. So Barry and Coron say, if you have any domain with a hole, then you have a positive solution. So I said, okay, I mean, there should be other solutions there, you know? You know? But uh, for example, if you look at a domain with a large hole, so say you take an annulus or an annular type domain, which is very thin. Okay? Then these guys, Ben Ayed, El Medi, and Hamami, they showed that there are no n bubble solutions in a domain like this. I mean, that if you fix n and you make the domain thin enough, then you have no n bubble solutions. Okay? So, I mean, you cannot uh, expect that the previous results I told you about, about the uh, small holes, will also work for domains with large holes. Okay? So there's no chance. So nevertheless, the question is, in a domain with a large hole, are there other solutions other than the Barry Coron one? Okay? So this is the next question I want to address now. And here is where the geometry of the problem plays an enormous role. So let me tell you something about the geometry. Okay? Okay. So let's go back to the problem in the whole Euclidean space. Okay. So one important fact, a very important fact about this problem in the whole Euclidean space is that it is invariant under the group of Möbius transformations. I will tell you in a moment what a Möbius transformation is, but the fact is if you have a solution, okay, if you have a solution U to this problem and you take U, compose it with a Möbius transformation, and then multiply it by this number, the determinant and so on, by the Jacobian to some power, then this is also a solution, okay? So an example of a Möbius transformation will be, for example, a translation or a dilation. So what's what uh, we are uh, reading here is what I told you just uh, uh, some slides ago about the instanton. Every instanton is just obtained by a Möbius transformation of the same instant. Okay? So what this says, okay, is that the problem is invariant under the action of the group of Möbius transformations. Okay. So what's a Möbius transformation? Okay, this is something very, very easy. A Möbius transformation is just a finite composition of reflections on planes and inversions on spheres. That's it. So this is the whole Möbius group. So examples of Möbius transformations are all the Euclidean motions. So translations and orthogonal transformations are, are examples of Möbius transformations, but also dilations are examples of Möbius transformations. And uh, in fact, inversions uh, on a sphere centered at the origin, things like this, are uh, related to the Kelvin transform, so the, they are they are uh, they appear in many places. Okay. So the idea is let's try to use this Möbius transformation, so or this conformal invariance of the problem, to obtain some results. Okay. So 
recently Filomena Pacella from Rome and myself we looked at uh, at um, at kind of a, pro a problem which is related to the Kast and Warner one. I mean, Kast and Warner said if you have an annulus, then you have infinitely many solutions. Okay, and now what we say is, well, we don't have an annulus, but we have a domain whose boundary consists of two spheres. So you have a sphere outside and a sphere inside, only that they are not concentric. Okay, what can one say? Well, what we were able to, to prove is that this problem has infinitely many solutions. So I haven't given you any proof of any results so far, and uh, I think you should be grateful for that. <laughs> but uh, this has a very simple proof. Okay, So let me give you the proof of this result. Okay. So here is the proof. The proof is just a consequence of the Möbius invariant. And it goes like this. Okay? Take your domain, whose boundary consists of two spheres. Then elementary geometry says you can always find a sphere which is orthogonal to the exterior sphere. And doing inversion on this sphere sends the, the, the interior boundary into a sphere which is concentric. This is just elementary geometry. You can always do that. And this is very easy, OK? But you see now our problem is Mebius invariant. And here we know we have infinitely many solutions. So take one solution and just pull it back here by Mebius invariance. So the Kast and Warner result will give us infinitely many solutions in this case. Okay. That's it. So, I mean, when we saw this, we thought, well, we want more, no? We got greedy, okay? Like Wall Street people. <laughs> okay. And then we looked at the following situation. You see, always compactness is a problem. So one has to deal with comp uh, the, the lack of compactness somehow, okay? So we put some finite group of symmetries in order to deal with the lack of compactness. So Gamma is just going to be a finite group of orthogonal transformations. So for example, you can look at the symmetry, the antipodal symmetry I was uh, looking at uh, before. Okay? So the, the, the orbit of the action of gamma is just the set of elements. I mean, you take a point x and you let every element in your finite group act on this x, and that's called the orbit. So let me let me. It's, it's easier if one puts a picture, OK? So we look at domains like this, which have symmetries. Oh, I think I am losing the microphone. OK, I hope that works. OK, so I am going to be looking at domains like this, which have finite symmetries, but a very large hole, OK? So finite symmetries, large hole, OK? And I am going to be looking for solutions which are also symmetric. This is not very, I mean, OK. And uh, OK, so what can one say? Well, what Philomena and I were able to prove is the following. OK, so you have a domain like this which has some symmetries given by a, a finite group gamma, and it contains an annulus, OK? Here is the annulus inside, but the annulus can be thin. I mean, you don't, you don't really need to have a thick annulus. You have, can have a very large hole like, like this, OK? Then say you want to get m solutions, OK? So I want to get m solutions, and I have a domain which contains this annulus. So what we were able to prove is the following. There is a number which depends on the number of solutions you want to get and on the thickness of the, of the annulus, OK, with the property that if the domain is symmetric enough, so if every orbit in this domain uh, has at least L elements, then we get M solutions, OK? 
So what this says is you don't need really to have something as symmetric as an annulus, okay? But uh, you need to have a domain which contains an annulus and which has enough symmetries, but still finitely many symmetries. I mean, the symmetries are finite. And then what we were able to show is, in this case, you have M solutions, and we can say one of them is positive, and the other ones are sign changing, okay? So that's the result. And the proof, I won't show it to you because uh, I don't have time, but uh, the proof is really very easy. So the proof is variational. The proof is very easy. I mean, it's not something exotic or complicated. It's really easy. But it involves a very, a very, uh, a new, a new idea, which I think is quite promising. Oh, I, I mean, we are hoping uh, we can do something with it. So the point is that the proof exploits really the Mebius invariance of the problem. And you see, in the, in the Quran type domain, I always use as a model the instanton. Everything looked look like bubbles or sums of bubbles or something that had to do with bubbles, okay? And here, what plays a, ro a role are the radial solutions on the annulus. So you have this thin annulus inside your domain. And what uh, plays uh, the role kind of uh, the, the model are the, 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 the radial solutions on the annulus. Now, one knows very well how the radial solutions look like. I mean, you just take the annulus, you split it. Uh, say you want to have one that uh, changes sign four times, like, like here, okay? Then you take your annulus, you split it in spheres with a property that when you do inverse inversion with respect to this sphere, then this, this part goes into this part, and so on. Blip, 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 okay? You split it like that. And then you put, say, a positive radial solution out here, and then you reflect it and reflect it and reflect it again, and you get one that changes, changes sign four times. So one knows them perfectly well, okay? And I on each piece, the energy is the same. So this is really, you have a lot of control about this, this, this guys. And uh, we, we, we hope we hope to be able to, to use these radial solutions as models to obtain some solutions also in domains which are non-symmetric. So together with uh, Massimo Grossi and Filomena Pacella, we are uh, looking at, uh, well, some, some problems, and uh, we think already we have some results, but uh, I mean, we still have to check some details, and I don't want to say something that's not true, so maybe next time we meet, I, I can I can tell you something about it. So, uh, well, that was it.